<clears throat> okay, I think this is working now. Sorry for the delay in getting things ready here, folks. Uh, this is Mingyal from Singularity Engineering, and um, I'm pleased to do a short presentation on reduced order models. I uh, had a lot of uh, Happy New Year, first of all, to everybody. I had a lot of uh, technical issues this morning because I got a new gadget that plugged my mo monitors in and that won't let me stream. So let's get this going. Um, a quick overview of Singularity Engineering. Uh, just a couple slides here to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are a SS cert certified channel partner here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We support the full suite of ANSYS tools from structural mechanics, fluid dynamics to low and high frequency electromagnetics. We've been around, uh, we're pretty new, been around for about a year and a half now, but we're working with lots of exciting companies uh, in the area. And uh, if you're around, let, let me know, I'd love to chat as well. So today the main focus, let me find my cursor here. Uh, today, the main focus is we're going to look at reduced water modeling. So um, there's some really interesting capability that ANSYS has provided. Maybe the first place to start is uh, take a look at Twin Builder. Um, ANSYS Twin Builder is an improvement over the ANSYS Implore product, and it allows us to do a lot of interesting things. It's a system level simulation tool, and what it's really good at is uh, integrating 3D simulation to control systems and uh, system level models. So if you're familiar with ANSYS tools, this obviously looks like electronic desktop. The part that we're going to be interested in are all the different sub-circuits that you can integrate. So you can see here from in, within Twin Builder, we can put in uh, Simulink and, and MathCAD components which are obviously commonly used for control systems applications. 
we can also add in uh, what we'll focus on are things like mechanical component, ice pack, state space, HFSS, and Maxwell components. So I've worked with some companies in the Bay Area, large and small. And one of the challenges for most design of uh, most systems engineers who are working with control systems is how do you define a control system when you have a complicated system, whether it's a thermal or a mechanical system. So we are going to work with that um, here. Let me dig up a good example for us to take a quick look at. So I have a few examples we're going to work through. The first, uh, first one I want to talk about is a, uh, is a, a basic thermal model. Now wait uh, just a second here for it to load up. Okay, so this is a, a basic thermal model with a uh, space claim geometry, and I'll walk you through what we're doing a little bit so you understand the background of um, this particular system we're setting up. Okay, so I work with a lot of electronics companies, and this is like a, you have your basic heat, heat PCB. We have some BGA uh, cylinders, uh, packages, substrate, mold. There's a chip inside. Have a vapor chamber and a, a heat sink, and I put a little fluid um, uh, beam element in there to do uh, fluid flow uh, simulation. Um, I actually need to do it. So let's let's start from here, and I will. Uh, I want to start from the beginning. So let's go and find my model. And put that in. So this is this is my geometry, um, and we can attach a a transient thermal system to it. So the first step you want to do when you're trying to characterize a thermal system is to do some transient simulations. These are um, this allows us to generate plant, the plant model, um, and there are a number of ways, a number of ways of doing this. So let's open up transient thermal and get started. I should probably close a few of these. Okay, simple model. I think uh, in this case, I want to get rid of the heat sink section. Um, so let's go ahead and suppress this, these components. And um, we want to have some sort of, uh, let's put a heat flow in here. So I'm not gonna worry about the mesh and things like that too much here. Let's, let's put five watts into the top surface of this. Um, uh, one of the things that's really nice today is that ANSYS has a fully integrated uh, material database now. So if you haven't used this, we can just say FR4 or uh, let's do PCB. Right, so there's all kinds of PCB laminates we can pick. Let's do uh, that. Um, going down this, this will be a uh, copper. So rather than going back to the, the um, engineering data, we can just put in a copper alloy. Uh, 
an encapsulant. This is an epoxy. Maybe not that epoxy. So the chip itself is going to be silicon. These are all kind of solder. Um, tin, silver, copper. So you can see one of the things that ANSYS really made uh, in the last releases is integration of really comprehensive material properties. You can also add uh, something like, um, I want to say 700 additional material properties from Granta fully kind of curated for you into this, so that's really nice. Uh, we added a uh, heat load here, so we can, let's put in a convection on top, do 5 watts, and then uh, the main source of uh, cooling for this will be through these channels. So we're going to select this beam, and we'll make it a thermal fluid element. It's going to be made of water. Let's do fresh water. And uh, for a fluid flow element, we need a few things here. We need an initial temperature. So we're going to fix this at 22 degrees. We need some sort of flow rate. Double click. Uh, mass flow rate. I think 0 0.01 was the value I was using. Uh, and that's it. So let's, let's do a, a quick simulation. One second simulation. Plot the temperature, just to make sure that the analysis works fine. So you can see we have some temperature data. It heats up a little bit in a second, and we get curves like this. Uh, the mesh is a little bit coarse. That's why we have some undershoot of the temperature. The other way to fix this is to switch uh, the element order from a quadratic element to a linear element. That prevents the undershooting of uh, temperature. It also runs a bit faster. So. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so it looks, looks better. We have very little undershoot of the temperature now. We have some sort of rise. So the goal of creating plant models is to capture this for various types of behavior. Um, and we can do kind of a, a bunch of interesting things now. Um, what the twin builder has is it's got this feature called a dynamic ROM builder. A lot of times for thermal analysis, we may want to include some nonlinear behavior. So by starting the dynamic ROM builder, it allows us to load in scenarios and develop a ROM that we can then use in the ANSYS twin builder. But to do that, we need data. We need uh, to generate a good amount of data. So we can do that by um, there's an ACT extension that we can use. So if I go on to, uh, let me open up a browser screen here. If I go to app store at ansys.com, app store.ansys.com and type in dynamic ROM, there's a dynamic ROM preprocessing. And that's what this app will do. Uh, it's, it'll help you create uh, dynamic ROM data in, in the format it, that it expects it in. So I have that ROM uh, not loaded yet, but I can do that real quickly. So if I go to the start page here, manage extensions, and uh, find my dynamic ROM preprocessor. And I go back, I have a nice little button that's right over here. So I can cl click on this to create a dynamic ROM pre 
it lets me set a location. So let's uh, go to my temp. do a ROM in my temp directory. So that'll be sure, new folder is fine as well. Um, then we can specify that we can start saving data. So we can specify what load we want. So let's do um, uh, heat flow. And we want the magnitude of the heat flow as an input. And we, maybe we want the mass flow rate of the liquid uh, as input as well. And on the output side, we want the um, die temperature. So I'll select maybe this top surface. And say I want the temperature on this part, the average temperature, sum, all items. And initial condition is going to be 22 degrees. It's important to put in this. Uh, it looks like the automatic initial condition sometimes doesn't work that well. Uh, we also want maybe the, the outlet temperature at that point in the fluid flow system. And this will also be 22 degrees initially. Okay. Okay, so now we can um, run a few, few examples. So let's, let's go ahead and um, start generating some data. So first I want to run a simulation. Actually, before I do that, here. On our analysis settings right now, we're using kind of non-uniform time stepping. Seems like it works a little bit better when I use uniform time stepping. And instead of one second, I want to do, say, 100 seconds. So let's do uh, five second intervals. Okay, these thermal problems finishes pretty quickly. Looks like it had an, an issue. Uh, it says that that file already exists. So let's rewrite that. Okay, and now if we go to that directory, my temp folder, new folder, right? It creates a scenario one. There's two CSV files. Uh, it's a. This will be the time versus heat flow magnitude. Oh, I, I'm using a strange time constant here. So this should be five seconds too. Let's do that. Okay, so now it should look a little bit better. All right, so this is every five seconds I have the input is, is the time versus heat, mag, heat flow magnitude and mass flow rate. Uh, and, and this is the output. So it shows me time versus temperature at the two locations. So what this allows me to do is generate a whole bunch of this data. Um, and obviously you want to generate different types of data, but let's take a look at what happens when we import that into our ROM builder first. Okay, so we need to browse to our location. I have some additional data defined from before. Temp new folder. Okay. So we can take a look at the data in this. Got a couple couple temperature plots and um, uh, excitations on top. And you can build a ROM based on this single excitation, single point of data. Um, then you can evaluate it to see how well it fits your scenario, um, and then you can save it. So this is my first ROM. And you can have multiple ROMs, but now we can export this to a twin builder. Okay. 
Okay, so it didn't. Let me see what happened here. I think I have to save everything for this too. So we got a ROM error. Yeah, so when we export this to a Twin Builder, uh, in this case, it's still in, oh, I, I think I know what the problem is. Um, the name, I, I like to put letters first, but apparently that doesn't like it. So let's uh, rename it to ROM. One. Okay, this time should be okay. All right, so then um, the ROM appears here. So this is uh, this is my ROM now. I have a heat flow magnitude. I keep hitting the wrong uh, keyboard here. He heat flow magnitude. We have a couple temperature outlets and the mass flow out uh, at magnitude. So we can start linking things up to this. So, you know, this is, uh, these are all um, non-conservative uh, links. So we can just hook anything to it. So let's uh, let's hook a sine wave input to my heater mag magnitude. So instead of having a constant heater, I'm going to give it a sine wave. I have five watts going in initially, so maybe the amplitude is five, uh, five and we want to offset, offset it by five. All right, let's do 2.5 uh, and 2.5. And then a, a frequency of uh, tens of a hertz. So every 10 seconds, we have a, a full sine sweep. So then we can run our simulation for let's say 100 seconds and a maximum step of uh, one second. That should be fine. We'll do a quick probe. Of uh, so a heat flow of magnitude, you can see that this is this is our heat flow magnitude in watts. Uh, this is a non-conformal output. Uh, so uh, Simplor or uh, Twin Builder keeps track of units. In this case, uh, we, we change the units. We ignore the units, so we have something like this. And then we can look at the temperature. Uh, when you know that it's steadily increasing, but you notice that there's these steps. And the steps are a result of the Twin Builder uh, algorithm when it tries to find a function if if your data is stepped like this at every five seconds you can see that the resulting twin builder result is also every five seconds uh, so the way we can s fix this is um, for scenario two we're going to use the same data but instead of every five seconds i'm going to do every one second oh i don't need that Generate this, and then maybe for scenario three, we'll do 0.1 second. So, so even though I'm taking much larger steps in the simulation, um, with Twin Builder we can generate data that's linearly interpolated uh, from two seconds to one second, to uh, from five seconds to one second here, to 0.1 seconds. So if we go back to my Twin Builder. And um, let's browse and select this again. So if we look at the, the results, they all look pretty similar, except some of them are kind of uh, more angular. Right? If we look at number two, it's a little bit smoother. Number one, it's, uh, it, it all looks the same because it is interp in linearly interpolating. But this, the fact that there's more data means that if I generate a uh, twin based on scenario three, although the equation looks the same, um, ROM two, right? OK. 
Okay, so it there's a little pop-up that says export it to Twin Builder. So now if I go back to my Twin Builder and I go to search and component back, now I have a new ROM. So let's see what happens when we put this ROM in there. And we'll connect uh, this to that. So let's run this. Okay, so using a 0.1 second data, I have a much I think it's still stepping a little bit, but it's giving me a much smoother plot, which is what I want in my simulation. Mass flow. So everything looks as we'd expect. The key thing here is that uh, if we see this type of stepping data, we really want in Twin Builder to ensure that we have uh, small sample size, and that gives us a smoother curve for analysis. Okay, um, there are different uh, type of input you want in analysis like this. So so far, I've only shown you kind of uh, constant heat flow, and this is you can think of this as a, a step function. You can also specifically uh, define a step function. So for example, I can say for the f first maybe five seconds, I have zero heat flow. And then at five, or maybe um, 4.9999, right? And then at five seconds, I bump this up to five. So this, uh, this step function is useful because it will capture a lot of the frequency information. Um, and we can run a, a scenario like this. So maybe instead of five, we, we want to have, um, yeah. So for scenario four, instead of a, a constant input, we can put in a step input. And if we go to Twin Builder, we browse for our data again. Right. Scenario, we can look at scenario four, and you can see that it's a step input. And we get a temperature that looks kind of like this. I think my time step is too big. Maybe I should have run that one at one second. Let's do that. So this will take a little bit longer to run, and we'll overwrite that scenario four. Okay, so we wrote that out and we have temperature plots like, like this where initially there's no heating and suddenly it starts to heat up. Um, and this gives you theoretically all the frequency information you need. Uh, sometimes you want to capture specific frequencies if you have certain operating conditions, in which case you can, uh, instead of having a ta tabular function like this, you can put in a, an actual equation. So one of the equations that people often use is a chirp equation, which looks like this. 
should change some of these values to to five. Okay. Well, this is ten watts. So initially we have a sine wave, and then progressively the sine wave gets sharper and sharper and sharper. Um, so if I make this number segment to a thousand, then I have pretty sharp data all the way through. It generates a thousand points automatically, and you can put in any f sort of function you want, but this allows me to investigate the frequency domain, kind of the response of the system as the frequency changes. Um, this is sometimes done experimentally as well. But obviously to capture this type of behavior, I would need a much smaller time step. Um, actually it's a thousand uh, in a hundred seconds. So if I took, put as 0.1 seconds, it will generate this just fine. So this will be number scenario number five. Okay. Um, so the idea here is uh, we are going to generate a series of scenarios. And you can see that there is scenario one, two, three, four. I'll have five now. Um, you want to use some of these scenarios to build um, to build your model. And then on the evaluation side, you can evaluate your ROM with the scenarios to see how it behaves. For example, you may put in a standard scenario you may encounter. Maybe it'll be uh, nothing's happening for 10 seconds, and then suddenly it go, goes up to 5 watts, la spans another 10 seconds, drops down, wait, wait for a few seconds, goes up to 10 watts, and back down. So you can put in some scenarios that you would expect to see then in the ROM builder side, you can evaluate that to see how, how it works. So we can try, for example, building a couple of scenarios based on scenario two and three, uh, a ROM. And then on the evaluation section, you can say, okay, how does that fit with scenario number four? And we can see the curve of, of the temperature, um, kind of the, the, the actual temperature plot, which is this one, and then the predicted one. So if I don't tell it, that it's possible that it's going to start with a, a little step where nothing happens. It's always going to uh, use that function. Um, let's try building the scenario. Oh. Yeah. So it's recommended that you have uh, a, a number of scenarios to build your model from. And it obviously takes a little bit more time. But then hopefully you can use that scenario to evaluate other scenarios and it will be a better fit. So you can see that even though the scenario was initially built with a little step function, um, it's able to capture the behavior otherwise. Well, actually, no, it didn't. So I think I need a few more uh, data points for this to really capture the behavior. Let's see how the simulation is going. So this will be a little bit slower, uh, but in the interest of time, we can keep going. So the, the, the goal of, uh, of this is to show you that you can download the ACT extension and start take any transient thermal simulation in ANSYS Mechanical and generate a large number of scenarios fairly quickly for the ROM builder. Then you can use the ROM builder to build a ROM or reduce order model based on that scenario on the scenarios you have, check it to make sure it's good, and then pull it into Twin Builder for any kind of simulation. Uh, so we can use this for now. I'm going to get rid of the that, scenario, that Twin Builder and just use this one. Okay. Um, the Twin Builder also has a number of um, other features, so one of the things that a lot of control system people wa would want to do is to do a PID controller. And you can see we have a, a bunch of PID controllers available, PID T1, T2. And if you right click on it and view the component help, you can get, it jumps to the component library, tells you a little bit about this PID. This is kind of the most basic uh, continuous PID controllers. And then we have T1, T2, where there's time dependent things. And you can also <clears throat> link up uh, other models from other tools as needed. Um, and this fully supports uh, Modelica and some of the other libraries. So if we want to integrate a PID into this, 
Let's flip it over. Uh, we can put in a sum block here. Did it get connected? Okay. And let's do that. I think it's maybe just some leg leftover visualization there. So we can connect this together like that. And we can feed this in. So the, the, the temperature comes out, we can feed that in, and then we can put in a, another source of some sort uh, and try to control it. So this, this allows you to build a full PID loop that you can try to control a, um, a system. Inside the block, we can put in the gain, the, the, the I and the D terms. Um, this one allows me to get a constant, you know, if I want to keep it at 25 degrees. Maybe the, the, the way this should work is we, I'd control the mass flow rate. Uh, so maybe I have some sort of function where the, the, the controller is feeding in um, heat flow information. We're extracting the temperature from the flow. Maybe a more reasonable thing would look something like this. Um, all right, if we if we really want to control our chip so that it doesn't overheat, let's connect that. Uh, maybe we send sense the temperature on the die, and then we have. Um, some sort of a source that feeds into our fluid flow controls. We have a controller that says, hey, if the temperature is too high, you know, we want to maintain the temperature at, say, 40 degrees. And if it's a, uh, so this is positive. Uh, so maybe it should be the other way. Oops. Maybe it should be like this. Okay. Hmm. Strange. Okay. And then we can do, uh, So this lets me control this, and I can say, hey, I, I want this to be 40 degrees at all times. So you can adjust the flow rate. Uh, I don't remember. I think I had a very small flow rate, something like that. Now let's crank up the gain to see if, if we can get something interesting going here. I think the problem is with this is that my data didn't include any changes in the mass flow rate, so this is not going to be very interesting. But the idea is that you can integrate a, a PID controller, and I'll try to make a video that goes through this in more detail. Um, but here we have uh, should have finished, so we have a, a data set of temperature based on the the, the chirp signal, uh, which has content in a lot of different frequencies. There's a few different chirp signals you can put in, but they're pretty straightforward to assign into um, SS Mechanical. And then we export this as data points. Again, we can go browse, find this folder, and you know, now we can take a look at the chirp signal. Right. So maybe we want to build uh, some scenarios with the chirp signal as well as uh, the step function. We can adjust the relative uh, percent error and things like that. Um, so here it's trying harder to get the ROM. OK, 
Okay, so this now matches my data much better. Uh, if we evaluate maybe scenario one, let's see how it does. Right, so it's a, a few degrees off, or the first one, uh, under predicting the the data here. Two, similar behavior. Three, four. So having some more data would definitely help with the uh, the fitting of the signal and getting an accurate ROM model. So I'll give you an idea of um, what we what I did previously. Oh, I can just show you this. So, so let's uh, go back to our other folder. Let's go to the marketing. Um, I think this is it. So I have a number of different scenarios here that are all uh, a little bit different. So there's some steps, there's some oscillation up and down, uh, different levels. So you want to span the design space, <clears throat> and you can see that the behavior are all very different. So when you have a lot of these different, very different types of data, and you build a raw model that does its best to fit all of them, then it's pretty accurate. And you can really, now you have a model that allows you to um, you investigate control systems on complicated uh, thermal models. The other thing I wanted to quickly look at is um, seeing a, a vibration problem. So I've shown a thermal problem, and you can use this is a, the, the dynamic ROM builder is kind of agnostic towards where you build it. It just needs a set of data. So if you can generate data in the right format in mechanical, in fluent, in electromagnetics, anything, it'll do its best to fit a uh, raw model to it. Um, there are some other more specific types of, of models. For example, uh, for vibration problems, we can, we can build a model for that. So let's, uh, oops. let's take a quick look at how that's done here. Okay, so this is a modal analysis. So in, in mechanical, oftentimes we want to lo look at the dynamic behavior of structures. Uh, sometimes we want to control them. So if you have an active damping system or active control system and you want to make sure your structure points at a particular location uh, accurately, there's a few options. One is, uh, one is to uh, make the structure really stiff so it behaves like a rigid body. If the resonant frequency is much higher than the structures, uh, than what you're loading it with, then you're, it basically behaves like a resonant, uh, like a rigid body. Uh, but making something stiff usually means you have to put more mass into it. It gets heavier than the inertia. Uh, is more complicated. So it's not always easy to get a system that is well defined, uh, that's easy to control. Uh, precisely. The other side is that sometimes you want you want things to vibrate, so you want to maybe design an oscillator or resonator, uh, but you want you have some sort of control over it. So um, micro mirrors or uh, haptic devices or any any of those systems could require c control systems to to ensure it has the right performance. So here I just went into space claim and drew this really poorly designed spring. Um, the idea is uh, is uh, 
I have a fixed support on one side, and I'm going to try to control this side, maybe to have it oscillate at a particular frequency, or maybe I want to uh, actuate it so that it, it's positioned at a particular location. Um, so the whole idea of taking a resonant frequency, which is very easy to calculate, now you want to couple that with a control system to control the pointing location of the structure. That's a bit trickier, and that's why we the simulation could help. So ANSYS has a command that allows us to generate a state space model. It takes uh, a little bit of work, but if you go into the help section, um, Oh, that's right. I think I just opened it, started here. If I search for ANSYS help uh, in the documents, it automatically opens up a web page like this. So let's go to mechanical application and search for mechatronics. Um, and there's an overall workflow for mechatronics. So this is how you go about creating a state space model from a model analysis. Uh, you can see there's a couple things. We need remote points that's named a certain way in order to uh, define the ports or the locations of actuation. So let's, uh, let's start from the beginning. I'll work through a, a model for you so that you can easily duplicate this in the future. I do want it to reuse the geometry, so all we're going to do is grab a modal analysis and put it onto the geometry branch. Right? This way I'm, I'm setting up the whole simulation from scratch. The geometry, uh, the material will be steel, but obviously you can change it to anything you like. The geometry can be anything that you can imagine or, or CAT model up, so it's very flexible. You can draw an arbitrarily complicated uh, spring, leaf, leaf spring, or support structure. Uh, whether it's for a robot arm or for a MEMS device or anything. Uh, and then you can use this tool to to calculate a reduced order model for it. it takes a, I think it's still loading up here. Okay. So what we want is <clears throat> I'm going to define the bottom as a support. It's going to be a fixed support. The top is where we're, we will actuate it, and for that we're going to imp, insert a remote point. It's going to attach to this surface. Uh, the remote points, if you if we look into the workflow here, has a specific name we want, input. So I'm going to hit F2 here and change that to input, not my name, this will be the top. Uh, UX which is this direction, right? Uh, but we also want a, a uh, maybe I'll call this one the UZ. Um, and then I can put another remote point here, maybe control this one, call it the UX. Should I should uh, denote this. There you go. So this will be the name that shows up in Twin Builder, and this is the degree of freedom that shows up. And you can have multiple degrees of freedom overlapping something as well. Um, so let's go forth and see what the next part is. Um, in the modal analysis, it's undamped, so we need to put a little command in to either damp a particular mode or put a damping ratio on all the modes. I'm just going to put a 2% damping ratio on all of the modes. So I can just copy and paste that that command in there. And then it says there's a macro that's located in this folder um, called that, that allows us to export the reduced uh, space model. So I can put in a command here, and here you can import that macro directly. Uh, and it'll show, show up as a, as a text and you can edit it. Or uh, there's a, a simple command we can use. Uh, that I've put in previously, 
that'll just call that macro and then run it behind the scenes. And it feels a little bit cleaner this way. So I'm going to copy that command over. Okay, so this is the command. A simple one line command that we call on the input of um, exporting a state space matrix from the location in the macros. That's it. Uh, let's go back here. Right, this calls SPM write then solves a modal file. Except there's a there is a, one more option and we have to specify a variable in the variable manager. This uh, and we need to set it to one. So there's actually a bug here. This this is uh, I think this is what we want the variable to be, but it was never updated in Ansys. So if we go into variable manager, add a variable, set this to one, and turn it active. Um, this should work, except instead of export to twin builder, we need this to be simpler. Still, this is the old name for twin builder. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this now. Okay, it did not work because if it works, you see a little icon like this. That shows you a picture of the matrix. So that kind of confirms that it works. It didn't work, but we can go into the settings and see what it said here. Uh, input label one are identical. Make sure you do. Okay, let's, let's change the names, I think. It wants me to... Let's shorten it up a little bit. Oh, it worked now. So you can see there's a little plus sign. That kind of, and if we go into the, so we didn't like really long names. Let's keep in mind to keep those names short here. And it, dumps out uh, a nice state space model for us. So this is the A, B, C, and D matrix is zero here. Uh, if you look into the ANSYS documentation, uh, the command is SPM write. Okay, I, I need to go into the APDL documentation. Um, so you can see that there's a, a lot of options for input, input labels, output. Uh, there's different formats that you can use uh, that allows us to export it into different formats. The default is Twin Builder, but you can use it as a dense format, which exports a full matrix, and you can obviously reformat as, that as needed to put it in any, anywhere you want. Um, we go back to our, so now that we have a model here, right click and open solver directory. The model is this SPM as, as well as a PNG file. So if we look at this, this is our state space matrix that ANSYS has created for us and that's our plant model. So we can copy and let's put it back into our temp new folder directory just for safekeeping. Then we can go back to our twin builder and uh, let's uh, add a sub-circuit and we'll do a mechanical component. So this is in the temp, new folder, this file. Okay. So we have a top Z, top X. Uh, these are conservative pins. So whereas these were uh, non-conservative pins, so you, it just takes in the value and outputs the value. 
These are actually conservative, conservative force displacement pins. So rather than circuit, we're going to have to find some mechanical displacement force representation. And we can put a force on this. Okay, so we're going to support that force and then connect it. And at the same time, you can measure uh, mechanical displacement. Let's do a position meter. This tells us what position it's in. Um, so let's also do a sinusoidal 10 Newton, uh, 50 hertz seems sure, why not? So I probably should break this up into two separate simulations, but let's, uh, let's do it just a second. Oh, we need to um, connect all the rest of it. So we, we need another force. I'll just set it to zero. So mechanical translational force. Just link it together. Yeah. So we can do a quick probe on this. Right, so that's, that's a, a little uh, plot of, of what the force reaction, the displacement is. Look at the force coming out of uh, TRB1. Looks like that, 10 newtons, and then flat. Uh, we can make this into a sinusoidal, a continuously periodic, continuously sinusoidal uh, device if you want. We can put in control systems that lets us try to control this structure as well. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. There's a lot of information, but the idea is to show you that with the ANSYS uh, suite of tools, whether you're working with Mechanical, thermal fluids, or electromagnetics, you can create reduced order models using this new dynamic ROM builder. This allows you to put in nonlinear behavior and a few other complicated phenomena uh, from just a data format. Um, if you can generate enough data, it'll do its best to try to replicate and fit a function to it. And then you can pull that into the twin builder to develop your control system. Uh, from a plant model that's captured directly from CAD. Uh, if you're working with specific tools like mechanical, um, Maxwell, RBD, HFSS, uh, IcePack, and Fluent, there are additional components, a uh, ways of generating specific state space models. And that allows you to uh, usually capture linear behavior very accurately. So thank you for your time. I know this ran over time, and I apologize for the initial issues with the um, uh, with the um, with the technical uh, problems but it looks like uh, people have seen it if you have any questions feel free to uh, send us send me an email my um, my email address is mingyao.ding at singularity eng.com company is Singularity Engineering, and if you want, feel free to check out our website, singularityeng.com. So thanks for your time. Appreciate all of your, appreciate the, the attention, and I'll uh, put some of these uh, examples up uh, on YouTube, uh, maybe shorter videos that talks about specific uh, parts and applications. Thanks again, and uh, have a great day.